Institute programs. We know this is an area of interest to many schools and LEAs around the state. Uh, my name is Megan Steiner. I am the statewide human capital K-12 strategies lead from IU13. And we are fortunate to have with us today a ex an expert in all things substitutes. So I will turn it over to Amanda Von Moos to introduce herself. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm Amanda, I'm from a nonprofit called Substantial Classrooms. We're a national nonprofit work across the country. And yeah, we specialize in this. So oh, hold on, let me get my screen going. So here's our plan for today. So we're going to um, talk about a framework for thinking about um, building your sub pools uh, with a specific focus on next year. So what does 20, uh, 2021 and 2022 look like? We're going to give you some ideas and examples um, about kind of what's most important as we think about this recovery year. Um, give you a chance to try it on and then share some resources and templates. We did make a private page for the workshop materials. So if you wanted to find the, the PowerPoint deck or um, some of the other things that we have in the resource section, you can go to that website. So it's our, it's our website, substantialclassrooms.org. And then that backslash PA, oops, PA dot, um, dash May dash 2021. Um, and it's just available to you guys, people participating in this workshop. So again, Substantial, we are a national nonprofit. We are on a mission to unlock the potential of substitute teaching. Um, we partner with districts and states um, in kind of three areas. We work on HR strategy and capacity building around specifically substitute teachers um, and what happens when teachers are absent. We work on school level best practices. So how do schools welcome subs? And then kind of our newest area of work is sub PD. So we have a competency-based um, a course and collaboration platform called SubSchool, where we do PD with subs. So I think this kind of goes without saying, but um, but I will say it because <laughs> we're here. Um, subs are really essential to recovery. So we have seen as schools began to reopen that there was there has for a long time been a shortage of people willing to take the job of substitute teacher right now, and. Um, uh, and we see that uh, as schools began reopening and we um, began entering into what we're thinking of as the next phase or the recovery of the pandemic, that we actually really need subs. We need subs to keep our, our doors open. Um, and we anticipate, it's hard to tell, but we anticipate that there will be more sub needs next year. Um, subs are kind of always our plan B as a sector. And yeah, we have a lot, a lot of stress in our system right now. Um, and teachers are going to need that backup. Um, but I think one thing that is really clear is if we want subs people to show up and sign up to be a substitute teacher, we need to do more to support them, to make it a more attractive and desirable job and a more um, sustainable job over time. So one thing I want to be sure to mention is, um, is that there really is a very significant um, uh, variation in coverage across schools and across types of schools. So from a principal perspective, just as we think about it from the systems perspective as HR leaders, I think sometimes we, we can, it's easy to lose sight of what does it really feel like when a school has, for example, a 53% coverage rate, a 50% coverage rate. So um, this quote comes from one of the principals that we worked on, that we worked with, um, and she had below a 50% coverage. That meant that when when she had a teacher out, about half the time she got a sub and about half the time she didn't get a sub. I think it's just really important to think about like what that means for the school. It means every day she is scrambling in the morning, they're breaking up classes and sending students to, um, to different classrooms to basically work in the back of the room. So it's sort of a lost day of learning for and impacting learning for a lot of kids. Um, I think as HR leaders, one thing, um, that we talk about a lot when we talk about strategy and something I want you guys to really be thinking about is disaggregating your data to make sure that you both know your overall coverage rate, but you know how it differentiates across schools so that you know where you have schools that, um, that sort of have most of their sub needs met. Those are bright spots you can look at. Um, and then also where you have schools, schools that are struggling with very low coverage and that those are the areas that we need to put our focus and attention 
And I think having spent a long time studying the dynamics around substitute teaching, it's really clear that we need some innovative practices. We need to think about a different way to meet the needs at those schools and cover teacher absence at those schools. They can't all fall on the principal. Um, and it, it, because it makes it very, it's, it's, um, there's so many dynamics that go into creating that unevil, unevil equal, sorry, coverage. So again, for us as HR, this is a really important thing to dig into. So uh, I wanted to share a few data points to get us started and grounded. Um, Ed Week actually did a white paper last summer that started to look at how is COVID impacting substitute teaching? So one question they asked is, um, what do you do to recruit and retain subs? What are your strategies? And I think what's interesting here is almost half a district said, we don't do anything. We don't have any clear defined strategies right now focused on recruitment or retention. I think that aligns with my experience when we you know, work with districts that this is usually an area um, that we have, we have so, it, it sort of is almost always on somebody's it's on people's to-do list, but it's usually pretty low on the to-do list. So my job today is to convince you that you, it is possible to do some more things around recruiting and retaining and to give you some concrete examples to do it. So the other question they asked here um, that I thought was really interesting is, um, it's kind of digging a little bit deeper on the PD question. So that was one of the strategies that people could choose in that first question. Now we're going a little bit deeper. So what PD do you think subs should get? And then what are you actually offering? And what I think is interesting here is these top three. These are really the things about doing the job. Classroom management, teaching strategies, and then ongoing PD, like helping people develop, develop their practice like we do for teachers. What's interesting here is the gap between what people think they should be doing. So two thirds of leaders like you think we should be offering classroom management PD, but we only have 11% of districts actually doing it right now. It's pretty significant. The other thing on this chart that's significant is, um, uh, is that over 44% of districts offered subs no training or PD at all. So with that, I wanna take us into a quick framework. Um, but to root us, what we really need to think about is how do we make substitute teaching a job that is desirable and sustainable? So this is our overarching question really for all of our work around building our pool. How do we make it a job that is desirable and sustainable? So we created a really simple framework that I wanted to offer. Um, and we made it simple to try to make it memorable for you. So we think that when you're building your pool, you should think about design, recruit, and retain subs. Here's what those categories mean. So design is thinking about what's this job? And it might be that it's actually more than one job. Um, think about things like what's the rate of pay? What's the work location, the hours, the duties? How does it fit into what we're trying to do as a district? How do we think about equity across schools? Then in recruit, how do I find people to do this job? This is about marketing, the application process, your onboarding process. And then retention, how do I keep people in this job? And these are areas like satisfaction, sustainability, skill development, connection. So when I talk to HR leaders, this is what I find usually, is we spend most of our time thinking about recruitment. And this is definitely what I get asked the most about is thinking about recruitment questions. Um, but the thing is, if we only focus on recruitment and we don't think about the design of the job and the retention strategies, um, what we end up doing is just having a revolving door. And it over time is harder and harder for us to keep up with that revolving door. And it impacts our students and teachers that they, you, you get um, uh, less consistency and um, yeah, and that makes it harder for everyone. So what we wanna suggest is that you really focus on balance. So to build a healthy pool, balance your time between all three of these key areas. And, um, and I think each time you find your brain going to recruitment, pull it back to say, how can I make this a more attractive job? And how can I help the people who are in it right now stay in it? Um, one common strategy that we see is often people will have a big enough pool, but their subs only like, 
they have a lot of subs not working very many days. So again, thinking about the recruitment and engagement strategies, it might be that that's what you need to do instead of putting all your time towards recruitment. Instead, you might need to think about how do I get my current subs to want to work more? Um, I'm going to focus more in this next section on design because we're in the spring and the spring is time to think about design for next year. Okay, I am powering through. I'm just going to pause. Megan, have we, do we have any questions popping up yet? No, we do not. Good. Okay. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so design. So one thing I wanted to mention is we have seen through the pandemic and um, in the early recovery that uh, lots and lots of places are responding to a shortage of substitute teachers by increasing pay and often also um, reducing the minimum qualifications. So this is fantastic. I think for a long time, we as a sector have been out of alignment with the labor market. We've been underpaying subs and that's part of what makes it hard to find people willing to do the job. So um, it is definitely a strong and needed trend nationally. Um, things to think about as you think about your own pay rates is um, thinking about local like labor market alignment. So who else is hiring at this education level in your community and what do they pay? Um, I think it really makes sense to invest in full-time roles. So um, full-time roles help, uh, help with that gap in coverage. Um, and they also just help with consistency for students. So, you know, I've now talked to hundreds and hundreds of people about substitute teaching over the last five years. And every single story that we hear, it all comes back to subs who come back to a school repeatedly, like frequently come back. And, um, and every single positive story comes back to that because if you keep coming back to a school, you develop relationships over time. And that makes it much easier to do the job, which is, you know, teachers know this. This is a big part of how teachers do their job. And, um, and the same is true for subs, that when they know students' name, when they know how things work on campus, when they know like where to find the bathroom and the best place to park, and that the school entrance is not where the formal address is, but is around the corner, all of these things make for a better day. So that's one reason I think as you, um, as you are thinking about maybe investing a little bit more around substitute teaching, or you're thinking about what does design look like for this coming year, really think about how do we get subs to be connected to a school community? And one big way to do that is the full-time role. Um, I wanted to also mention that, you know, across the board pay increases are, they add up for substitute teachers. So it is something so that it's a big undertaking to think about increasing pay. I definitely think you should, <laughs> don't get me wrong. But if, if that's not possible for your district right now, we've seen some smaller investments that, um, that help. So things like appreciation and service recognition gifts, um, these are borrowing a little bit from the world of volunteer management. So how do we keep people engaged? Um, things like team gear, so um, polos and um, lanyards, these things that make them feel part of your team um, actually go a long way for substitute teachers because they're really desperate to feel a part of, of it. They feel very isolated often. So the more signals we give them that they're part of the team, the better. Um, PD is actually really valued by subs. So supportive PD is, is something to think about investing in as a recruitment and retention strategy. Um, and then I love, we have some examples across the country of people investing in mentoring. So um, the most common structure for this is having a retired principal who comes back and, and their job is to mentor subs in their districts and to be there if people need help. Um, I think it's, it's a very lovely, um, especially in a smaller district, it's a really lovely strategy. And then the other one's common is drive-through coffee hours right now and things like that that give um, small tokens of appreciation. So as I mentioned, full-time school-based subs is my favorite and strategy, I think, because it really gets at both the equity questions, but it also just makes a better day for everyone and it makes a more attractive job often. So a full-time school-based sub is just what it sounds like. <laughs> so they're a full-time person assigned as a sub at that school. Um, and you can look at your data and figure out in most schools, um, outside of really small schools, there usually is somebody absent almost every day. So there's not that many days where they wouldn't have a sub assignment. But when they don't have a sub assignment, they can also provide things like tutoring, small group support, 
they can be in the classroom observing how the regular classroom teacher teaches. That helps subs to build their practice. It also helps that relationship development and their credibility with students so that they're much more able to step in and, and continue instruction. Um, a lot of places, I, I'm not sure, I, I'm most familiar with this in California, but um, a lot of places are experimenting with um, flexible staffing for this coming year. So we know students are coming back with a, a range of experiences during the pandemic and a lot of need for differentiating um, instruction and support. And so I think there, um, there are growing movements to say, how do we bring more adults into school to help out and to be able to do that one-on-one -on -one support that we know our students are gonna need. As you, if you are exploring these, so sometimes that means bringing your after-school staff in during the day, expanding tutoring, those kind of things. Think about, is it possible for those folks to also cover absence? Um, and is it possible maybe for them to go in as a team to cover an absent, to cover absence? Again, all these things help with continuity for students, relationships for students that, you know, our students have experienced a lot of trauma this year. So the more that we can have known and safe adults in their life, the, the better. Um, and I'll just, the other thing I didn't say that I meant to say in that section is um, that a lot of districts right now do have school-based subs because of the Con health concerns in the pandemic. So I think this is one change that we should actually, um, we should keep into next year and we should add a little bit of design to make it even more impactful. I want to give you a concrete example of this. So um, I love this program. It's called the Warrior Teaching Program, Teaching Fellowship. Um, it is a, a one year school, full-time school-based sub um, model and they, uh, it, they do it as an application base, so people will apply to be a fellow, and then they, they come and um, they are part of a cohort of other fellows. They meet together once a month. They also do, pre, they do PD in the, in the fall together. Um, and I have that um, job description for you on the resource page if it's something you wanted to look at. This one in particular is interesting to me because it was developed because they didn't have enough subs. So it was developed as a strategy for recruiting more substitute teachers. And they, they made it, they put it out there in their very first year, they went from not being able to attract substitute teachers to having 85 applicants for their first 15 slots. Over time, this program has come to be their primary pipeline for their districts. It wasn't designed to be a pipeline, but um, it turns out that people who are interested in signing up to be a full-time fellow and to receive additional PD, they are are also people who are interested in finding a teaching assignment and growing into a teaching assignment. So this is a small district and they, they now, this has become a pipeline, not just for them, but also for their surrounding districts. I'll pause there, Megan. Am I pacing okay? Um, okay, so the next thing to talk about is just connecting to your pipeline. So as I said, the Warriors Fellow is a great example of a, a strategy that connects directly to pipeline. Um, I think as we think about the fall, there is a lot of anxiety about pipeline um, and about making sure that you're gonna have enough teachers. So as a sector, I think um, recognizing that a lot of people are checking us out through substitute teaching. So if you're coming from another career, um, a kind of common story is people who, um, both parents, but then also people who have been in the freelance economy and are realizing that they want more stability and they want benefits and they want some of the things that you get when you're a teacher. The easiest way to check out if you are a mid-career person to check out maybe is teaching for me is to sign up as a sub. So um, as a sector, I think bringing more attention to realize that people are checking us out this way. We want them to come work for us. Um, so thinking about how do we make this a more direct connection? In our surveys that we've done for districts, we find about 50% of subs are aspiring teachers. It does vary by, by community, but you know, the lowest we found is a district that has a, most of their subs are retirees. And for them, it was about a third, still kind of surprising. Um, so in terms of thinking about pipeline, college students is a really natural place to be thinking about pipeline connection. 
Um, and I think this is another area, just like full-time subs and school-based subs, we experimented with as a sector during the pandemic. A lot of places are experimenting with encouraging college students to, um, to work as subs. And I know Pennsylvania is like California where you do need a BA to be a sub, but there is an exemption for people who are in college. Um, in California, we call it the aspiring, it's um, aspiring, ooh, now I've got it wrong. It's college seniors and it, it is um, perspective, it's called the perspective teacher credential um, or emergency sub permit. Um, so this is an area I think for districts to think about leaning into and, and working on building connections. Um, I just shared an example that Monmouth University, um, they encourage all their undergrad education majors to substitute teach. They view it as a learning opportunity for future teachers and a way to get your feet wet. It's also a way for them to serve their local districts and, um, and deepen their connection with their local districts. Um, and what's nice about that one, and I think this is the most successful ones are modeled this way, the university, per, you know, the, the School of Ed at the university sees it as a learning opportunity. So they actually do the workshops for their students so that when, so that they're prepared to step into the classroom and they're prepared to think about this as a learning experience. So it is important for college students that we, we do think about how do we how do we make sure that they get support, that they're not just thrown in the deep end, especially if we're thinking about it as a pipeline program. Um, we have a guide for you guys that is also on the website um, that is just what we have learned from helping districts with developing these kind of programs. Okay, so those are some of the design questions for this coming year. Next, we're gonna talk about retention. Um, and retention is important to, again, reduce the revolving door so that you're not spending all your time just trying to fill up your pool. <laughs> um, so one thing I, I've just been telling everybody as we've been meeting this spring is we do anticipate that we'll see an increase in long-term subs this coming year. It's an important time to revisit your practices and culture around long-term subs. Um, one thing that the pandemic made really clear is when we were in virtual, a lot of subcommunication happens through um, in happens in person and often happens through um, it often happens through teachers being kind and um, and this is you know educators are kind by by <laughs> like almost all right they're kind they want to develop and support people so what happens with long term subs is often what you hear in interview when you talk with them is that you know, I was in this job, I was really overwhelmed, and this really nice teacher took me under their wing, or took pity on me, um, and like showed me the ropes, gave me some curriculum, um, and I think those are lovely stories. However, when we think about a system, um, I, I don't think that we should re be relying on people being kind, and on, um, on subs feeling like they just got lucky that somebody mentored them, because it also doesn't happen all the time. Um, and then when we went online, you can see that actually those kind of more casual systems, more casual ways that people got the information and support that they needed weren't possible anymore um, because you're not bumping into people in the hallway and you're not overhearing somebody in the lunchroom. So we have to be, we had, it made people reflect, like have to get a little more serious about practices here. We did make a template for, um, for we made a template this year that I put a, again on the website some of the best practices in this area to think about are um, having a handoff meeting. So when you are placing a full-time sub, making sure that you, you have some sort of handoff between HR and the principal to make sure that you're clear about who's doing what and that the sub is getting what they need. Um, in the pandemic, we had things, you know, when we were doing virtual, it was things like, do I have the Zoom login? Do I know, like, do I know who's in my class? Um, am I going to surprise parents when they log in and see somebody different there? Um, and I think that these same things carry through to when we return to in-person. Uh, we also strongly recommend that you have some small amount of pre-assignment planning time and that that's paid. That's something that almost nobody does right now, um, but it makes an enormous difference for continuity. Uh, clarity on the curriculum and grading expectations. This is an area where we, we sort of I think um, we gloss it over because it really is asking a lot of the sub. Um, and uh, and what, that, what ends up happening is that uh, it doesn't feel like anybody's job and, um, 
and can be a source of a lot of frustration. Um, again, you wanna have that plan for introducing the sub to the families. And, um, and we think that sub should be included in teacher PD opportunities. And so getting clarification with the principal on that. Um, so in terms of retention, kind of the most important thing is creating connections and making subs feel like they're a part of what's, what you're getting done, you know, a part of the team and a part of what you as a district are doing to try to, um, uh, to support your students and your community. So subs often feel isolated. It's when we interview subs, one of the most clear things that comes forward is this feeling of isolation. So, you know, think about focusing on building connection in two ways. How do we connect people with school communities and how do we connect people with each other so that they can find support? Some, you know, I've already mentioned formal mentoring is one way that people do this. Um, sub PD and gatherings, so like celebrations. Um, and, uh, and I think things, finding ways to encourage best practices. So things like making sure the sub gets introduced to the school community. Um, these, are, these are things that help subs, again, feel less isolated. So um, less like a visitor on campus and more like part of the team. Um, and the last thing around retention is to invest in quality PD. Um, so I think commonly the PD model for subs is that we do a one and done right when they get hired. And um, you saw that in the data that we shared at the very beginning. But this one and done is usually uh, less than four hours. And it's usually we show them how to use the assignment system. We talk about how payroll works. Maybe we do mandated reporting and sexual harassment or something like that. Often districts will say, and then we do a half an hour in classroom management. And I think, um, I think what's important here is to think about how do we support new teachers and uh, and then to let that be our guide in thinking about what, what does quality PD look like for subs? It probably isn't a half an hour in classroom management um, because we wouldn't accept that for a, a teacher. Um, so I think focusing on how do we help people build their practice over time. The other thing that, uh, that I think is important to know in this area is that substitute teaching is a very unique job. It is not the same as being a teacher, um, although it's similar. So, if you like sort of step one on PD, a lot of people make their, their PD available to their teachers, also available to subs. Um, I think to be most supportive, you also need to help subs understand their unique role in, in education. And you need to, your, your training needs to resonate with their lived experience, with what it's actually like to do the job. So designing for the unique role of a sub is important there. Um, and some of the things I think, you know, when we think about our sub competency framework, um, things like being flexible is really important for a sub. Having role awareness and understanding what's my job on campus and, uh, and a little bit, what's my limitation if I'm just meeting a student. Um, I think it, there are some natural limitations on how to engage with those students. Um, and all those things are things that, again, they're unique to a sub. They're not the same as a classroom teacher who's going to be there. Um, day after day and be, be focused on building relationships and systems. It's always so funny presenting in this fashion <laughs> where, where you don't have, I only, I can only see Megan. Megan, do you have any, are there any emerging questions? Okay, I'm going to keep powering through then. Um, so let's talk about recruit. So this is the area I think, again, subs are, HR leaders spend most of their, if they're thinking about subs, they're thinking about recruitment. So I just wanted to offer just a couple thoughts here. But again, my big thought is, is balance, right? So when you think, when you think about recruitment, think about design and retention so that you're not, it's not a, a, um, a bucket with a lot of holes. So again, on that website, we have a, a self-assessment for recruitment readiness. Um, and I think, again, Design and recruitment strategies, design and retention strategies to help to fuel your recruitment, but you got to make sure your recruitment systems are solid. So um, the kind of biggest things I think that we notice is that um, often districts will have a lot of out-of-pocket expense up front. So in California, it costs about $350 to become a sub. And um, the pay rates vary across the state, but it's something like around a hundred to $200 a day. So you have to then sub for a couple of days just to recoup the, the money that you've invested. 
the more that you can do to recruit to reduce that out of pocket expense, the more successful you'll be in recruiting. Um, one very common thing we see is that uh, people will use their standard teacher application and they'll just put the word sub on it. Um, I think it, it really behooves you to create a sub specific application because often subs get confused as they go through the, the regular teacher application. Um, and the regular teacher application asks for a lot more information. We don't need, you don't need, and you aren't using that much information when you're evaluating a sub. So make it sub specific. And then the last thing is, is I think this is a best practice across all of recruitment, but making sure that you have regular communication. When you're recruiting a sub, you're recruiting at volume. Um, so making sure that you're really tight and have good systems for how you keep people engaged and moving through this, moving through. So yeah, again, you can find that self-assessment on the website. Um, a couple of recruitment best practices. Um, these are just, again, areas for you to be thinking about. So think about your school community. Um, and these are areas where HR can create some templates for schools to be using. Things like flyers, a PTA blurb, um, information that your principals might be able to forward out to any community partnerships that they have. I think one next level practice here is offering school tours. So if you are in the community and you are thinking about becoming a sub, we have an open house on this day. Come meet us, we'll give you a tour of the school. This is especially important right now because people are feeling anxious about the safety protocols so, um, and anxious about technology because they're uh, often the subpopulation is one that's less comfortable with tech. So tours is a really nice way to, to sort of meet people and have it feel personal and, um, and be able to make it so that when they come to do their first day of subbing, it's not the first time they've been to your school. Um, another very common pool for us is the retired teacher pool. Um, so most districts are doing this already, but if you're not, make sure you build this question into your exit interview. So as people are leaving for retirement, say, would you be interested in being a sub, can I add you to the sub pool? And you keep them active in your ERP system so you don't have to re-onboard them and set them up back up in payroll. Um, some states, I don't know how this works in Pennsylvania, some states are um, waiving. There's, there's often a little time that you have to wait before you can sub, before you can earn, earn income again um, from a school district after you enter retirement. And we've seen in the pandemic, people are waiving that one. I think a next level practice here is trying to make those retired teachers um, mentors in some way, trying to help them mentor the folks who are coming, often structuring PD in a way that has a lot of breakouts allows this to naturally happen. Um, and then also trying to, trying to encourage those retired teachers to, to work in some of your low coverage schools. So a differentiated um, strategy there. And the last area, college and university partnerships. So we've already talked about this a little bit. Um, and I think uh, the thing about recruiting on campus is it's all about building relationships with faculty who will let you come talk to their big classes and recruiting on campus. So, um, so think about going to students where they are. Uh, and then the next level of course is pairing with, um, with training or embedding in a course for them. So lots of universities, education students almost always have to do field work. Um, substitute teaching is a way they can do paid field work. So connecting the dots there. Um, so uh, Megan said to make sure that I told you this one. So one thing that we really strongly encourage when you're thinking about recruitment is to make it story-based. This, this is a little bit of modern marketing, right? That the way we are reached right now is through short stories. Um, and, uh, and I think the more that you can highlight actual subs talking about their real experience in your schools, the more people can envision themselves as subs. So that I think like the marketing advice we're getting right now is, um, is uh, authenticity is what's most important. It doesn't need to be polished, but it does need to feel real. Um, so help people envision themselves by sharing real stories interview snippets, people talking about the why um, of why they enjoy and what keeps them coming back. And that's usually almost always subs will say, I enjoy the flexibility and I really, I like when I get to connect with a student, like that feels meaningful and important to me. 
Um, and one last example in the world of recruitment is, um, is doing so again, helping people envision themselves in the role. A lot of people, it's intimidating to think about if I've never worked in education, coming and being a sub. Um, so we wanna to try to reach those people and to help them again, envision themselves doing the work and let them know what kind of support they would get doing it. So this is an example of one that we did many years ago now um, where we had, it was through the adult school of a district and it was just becoming a substitute teacher in our county. Um, so it was a day long PD of like, what does a sub do? Um, building out sort of some of those core competencies, like how do you introduce yourself to a class um, and then the, the real practical stuff of like, how do you actually apply and what are the requirements? Uh, we did it as an experiment. We had no idea what would happen. And we, it sold out faster than anything else that adult school was offering that, that I forget what they call them, that 10 week time. Um, and they, it, it was a very encouraging experience. Like they showed up and really wanted to learn. And it was primarily retirees from who had been like, I've always wanted to be a teacher, but I just didn't know how, and I didn't know I could qualify. So I think it's a little counterintuitive um, to think that actually offering an unpaid upfront workshop um, really helps with recruitment. You don't want to make it required. You don't want to raise, you know, you don't want to create more barriers. You want to make it opt-in to help, help people who want that, who, who have thought about substitute teaching, but won't be comfortable without some added support. Okay, pausing one more time. Great. <laughs> so I'm just gonna now set up this because we have a smaller group, we're not gonna do the great breakouts today. So you'll see it on the slide as a breakout, but I'm just gonna talk about it as a, a, an individual exercise. So we wanted to give you a chance to try out some of the ideas that we're talking about, try out that design, recruit, retain framework. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you three what we call personas, like three examples of people you might want to reach, types of people you might want to reach. And you're going to have some time um, to then think about, um, if I was trying to reach that specific person, what, how, how would I approach it in terms of design, recruit, and retain? Um, and then, yeah, then we'll have a little, I think, moment of debrief, and then, um, and then think about a small step, right? as the theory of change, that when you're doing this kind of design, it's important to try out it in, in a small form. So here are our muses. So three personas, they're all based on real people. The first is Dawn. Dawn is a lovely, very vibrant lady. <laughs> she has kids. Um, we met her at a, at a workshop for aspiring teachers. So she's the mom of two elementary school kids. She's been really involved at their schools. Um, she is a... Um, a personal trainer and rock like rock climbing instructor um, who's really good at that, but that doesn't offer very much stability. And especially as she's getting older, she's realizing she wants to feel like she's making progress in her career. She wants to feel like she's going to have a retirement um, and benefits and that kind of stuff. So she is one persona you could you could be inspired by. Next is Maria. Maria's a college senior education major. Um, she is a first generation college student, fluent in Spanish. Um, she needs to work to be in school, right? She has to have a job. She wants to become a teacher. She, um, she actually, we met her through a sub workshop and then I happened to run into her at my kid's school because she um, has to do field work. And so she was, she was like trying to find a part-time job while also being a volunteer tutor. And I think it was that, that moment of saying like, oh, she has to work and she wants to be in classrooms. We should be, we should be connecting the dots and putting her to work in classrooms. So, so you, could choose, you could choose Maria, she's incredible. Um, and then we have Mike. Mike is a retired teacher. He is looking to stay active. He loves to travel. Uh, he has a boat. So he travels for six week periods during the year where he goes cruising. I think he goes to Hawaii. Um, but he also really is feeling a, a, like he wants to be connected to, um, to the community that he had when he was teaching. So Mike could also be your inspiration. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna skip the group breakout. So we're just gonna do this quick, right? Um, so take any blank piece of paper 
And uh, you're going to write your muse's name at the top. I'll bring those back in a second. And then I want you to create three areas in your page, design, recruit, and retain. So in the design area, think about who, what is this person looking for? What would be attractive to them? How might, if you were designing a job just for them, how might you structure it? In recruit, where does this person hang out? How might I meet, meet this person? Um, and what kinds of things would they need to feel comfortable st stepping into that job that I've just imagined for them? And then in retain, what kinds of PD and support would they want and need? So we're gonna have three minutes on this quick write and I'll bring back our muses. And I'm gonna mute myself. I wish I had so me. I hope that, so um, I hope that this exercise helps you to kind of expand how you're thinking about um, how, what this job might look like. Um, and you guys will have the slides after. So I think this is a great thing to do with your team is to really think about this again. If I'm picking somebody and going deep or picking a kind of sub and going deep, what do I think about design, recruit and retain? And think about this a little bit as a brainstorming so that if you pick different people or different types of people to be your inspiration, it's going to lead you down different paths. And eventually you might find one path that you're like, this really fits my district. This really fits what we need. Um, so I'm curious, Megan, Aaron, Andrew, <laughs> as you did that, um, did you have any ahas or, um, or things that came up as you th thought about what would be attractive to your muse? Well, I, I was thinking about how some of the things that I might use to attract or retain the college student are similar to what I might do to attract or retain a, gra a graduate of an ed prep program to come teach mm -hmm. for me, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, introduce them to new teachers from their alma mater who can tell mm -hmm. them about what it's like to work at the school, get them involved in extracurricular activities and, and things that they're passionate about so that they might want to be more involved in the school. Um, so I think that was an aha for me of how, especially when you're talking about people who are brand new to the profession, how there can be that overlap between teacher and sub recruitment. Yeah. Awesome. Anybody else want to share, Erin? Oh, you're muted still. <laughs> Praise the 2021. <laughs> the first, the, the, the mother, the first one, and even the last one, just how much helping to, you know, just how the workplace environment probably would have affected their recruitment, you know, if they, um, or, and retaining them, like if they felt like they were part of the school community, if there was meaningful work for them to do on a regular basis, that that would probably impact, um, and that they felt like they had a support system over there that would probably impact both recruitment and retaining of, mm -hmm. of those people because that's part of what they're looking for is this I want to do better for my community I want to stay involved I want to stay engaged and so those mm -hmm. little tiny workplace environment things could have made a big difference awesome anybody else want to share um I guess uh, for both like the working mom and the uh, grad student, um, like the, what you'd been talking about, the pipeline to teachers mm -hmm. um, seemed like a good option for both of them since they were both kind of like, oh, possibly want to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and so like getting them experience as well as like s during their PDs or, you know, like mentoring them to become teachers at the school. Yeah, I think helping people feel like there's a path, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you feel inspired, um, one thing that we know from working with districts on systems change is, uh, is that you, you got to think small steps and to sort of test the waters. Um, and to get, I think the other thing is sometimes so like, like substitute teaching is an area that we don't focus on very much. And so sometimes it can feel really big to do work in this area. So we wanna help you um, 
we want to inspire you to think big, but we also want to inspire you to take action. So um, I'm just going to leave here in just a few seconds if anybody wants to add into the chat an action step. So think about that big idea that you were had and what is some really small things that in particular, I mean, I think a hack, you want it to be fast. Like this is something I could think of doing this afternoon, or this is something I could definitely do by Monday. So just feel free to drop those in the chat. I'm going to keep moving because we are such a small group. Um, okay, so these are all the resources I mentioned. I know I was talking fast as I do when I have no visual feedback of seeing all you guys, <laughs> but these are the, the resources that I mentioned throughout. Um, so, and then there's one more that we haven't talked about, but we preview just a tiny bit here, which is um, journey of an idea. So this is what we have learned through about doing innovation work in legacy systems. So um, we have a case study for you and some worksheets that I think, um, I think are fun. It would be fun to do with your team. We used an illustrator with them. So that's why I can say that they're fun, <laughs> fun worksheets. Um, we have the long-term sub assignment template, the recruitment readiness self-assessment, um, the full-time job description, job design considerations, and the Warriors Fellowship job description as an example. And then a work like a, a guide called Empowering College Students as Subs that has kind of what are the common um, program elements and uh, and best practices. Um, yes, and Megan would love for you to give feedback for future sessions. So the, um, I think she's going to also put the link in the chat, but you know, this is the beginning of a series. So if you can put your, um, give your feedback that will help her with creating the rest of the series. And this also applies to anyone watching the recording at any point in time, the forum will <laughs> still be open. Awesome. Yep. And that's, I think we have reached our end. <laughs> So that's my content.